Today we have an awesome guest here who flew from all the way from down under, and uh, they are the friend, their supporter, they are our advocate, and uh, so with that I'll just um, pass uh, the to end. And once we have this presentation, we'll have food, we'll have beer, and time to talk about what Ant is going to tell us and all the interesting things we have. All right, welcome. Thanks, Dimitri. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I feel like I should stand behind here and kind of do like a university lecture style, maybe, or this could go casual. Um, so hi, I'm Anthony Shaw. I work for a company called Dimension Data. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, um, we sponsor a team at the Tour de France. That's how a lot of people know us nowadays. Uh, but we're an IT company. We have um, just over 30,000 employees. We operate in about 40 countries, I think. Um, in terms of what we do, uh, these are the kind of the four big pillars at the moment. Digital infrastructure, hybrid cloud is a ma massive focus area of ours. Um, a project we've been doing um, over the last year is we actually operate a detection and drone network um, in the Southern Cape. So I don't know if you know, but the, the rhino is an endangered species. Um, poachers are constantly attacking rhino. It's a massive issue. Um, we're a South African company. Um, so because of our African heritage, we feel a certain responsibility to kind of intervene and help as much as we can. And also being a technology business, um, it's not just about throwing people at the problem, actually. What we've tried to do is leverage a lot more automation. Um, so we can't go into too much of the details um, because there's a lot of security involved. The, the rhino horns are worth so much money. Um, what we've actually done is we've, um, we've partnered with another company, but we run basically an automated drone network. Um, around some of the areas in the Kruger, um, which is in South Africa, it's a big national park, um, and we actually detect poachers um, and we alert a team of people who can fly out on helicopters and squad cars and stuff. So this is kind of like a, an approach that we've used, but it's more about integrating different pieces of technology together to create a single solution. So instead of me reeling off every single thing we do, um, that's like a summary of an example solution that we've, we've done. So just a bit, a bit about what I do. Um, like I said, we have uh, just over 31,000 employees. I'm the uh, group director for innovation and technical talent. Um, and part of my job is to look at um, our skill base across the business. And one of the biggest shifts we have at the moment is what we're calling software skills or software-defined skills. Traditionally, um, software or software skills was a function of software engineering or software development. Um, now it's becoming more and more the case. Coding is like a part of IT people's jobs across um, operations, in storage function, in networking. Pretty much it's bleeding into everything. Um, so one of the things we've been doing recently is we actually just this past week, we launched a Learn to Code initiative where we've offered Python training to every single one of our employees. Um, just tracked, we're one week in and we've got um, people taking up across 20 countries already. So we spanned across, I think, five, five continents in the first week. So it's going really well. Um, I'm super excited. And also, um, I focus a lot on DevOps. So one of my big initiatives this year is trying to build a DevOps skill functionality in our business. Um, and I say I'm targeting about 2,000 engineers in the first year. Um, so it's a pretty large scale project. Um, and attacking that kind of skill base is a, is a massive problem. So I'm going to kind of share with you a bit about DevOps practices and what I'm currently thinking about event-driven automation and our experiences with Stackstorm and how that kind of those two things work with each other. So I gave this talk um, two days ago at the Gartner event in Las Vegas. Definitely a much more business um, sort of focused audience. I know this audience is a lot more technical, so. What I'm going to do is talk about some of the, the business side of things, but we will go into some technical examples as well. I've tweaked the slides slightly, so we've kind of notched it up a bit. Um, but the time we've got afterwards, the Q&A sessions and the discussions after the event, um, is really your opportunity to kind of dig into anything I show here. So um, these are the four things we've, we've noticed this year in DevOps. Um, the, the number one issue for us at the moment is, is skills. Um, trying to hire people in DevOps um, is really, really hard. Um, I've hired software developers in the past, um, and it's a pretty well understood skill. 
and in terms of where to find them, it's pretty well understood. Trying to hire DevOps engineers or automation engineers or whatever they're called is really difficult. Um, I live and work in Sydney. Um, it's hard to hire them there. We have offices down the road. It's hard to hire them here. Um, so basically, all over the globe, this is a real challenge. I think this will probably change next year as DevOps becomes a bit more mainstream. Um, but definitely, if you're in the DevOps space, you're very, very lucky. <laughs> Definitely got the pick of the crop. Um, another problem we're seeing is that DevOps is becoming siloed. And I'll give you an example. Um, we worked with a client, and we said, what's your experience with DevOps? They said, yeah, we've got a DevOps team in operations. We've got a DevOps team in development. We've got a DevOps team in engineering. We're doing great. And they're like, OK, so what, what tools are you using? Oh, well, the engineering team is using Puppet. The operations team is using Chef, and I think the the other development team was using Chef as well, which is a slight overlap, but still. Um, and the siloing of tools, technologies, and teams really goes against a lot of where you see value in DevOps. Um, and we'll talk a bit later about ways that we can kind of address that. Another point is that point solutions are multiplying fast. I'm going to show you a slide in a bit about particular tools and technology. But when we start to talk about DevOps, there's two things that happen. People jump into talking about continuous integration and continuous deployment, which is like part of the problem. Great, you can deploy your app 10 times a day. You haven't achieved DevOps. You know That's not done. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, another point is that uh, the number of tools is exploding and exploding and exploding, um, especially in the container space. Um, we've already started working in that space. We have an R&D group who's building a number of tools around the, uh, containers, um, and that's just changing like every week. Another thing I see um, when I talk to clients and also internal teams is that I say, where are you up to with DevOps? And they're like, yep, we've got DevOps. Um, someone wrote a bash script once, and then we automated some stuff. DevOps is good. We, we saved some time. Um, so really trying to dig into where people are actually on DevOps is a real challenge. So in terms of structuring the teams, um, there's two, two approaches that we've looked at both internally and ones that I've seen addressed with clients. Um, the temptation is that, like I said, with siloing, different teams have tried different tools. They've said, great, we went, we're going to use Puppet. We're going to use Chef. So then someone comes over the top, whether it's like a head of engineering or someone higher up, like a CIO or something, and says, this disparity of tools is causing us a lot of headaches. We're going to create a central team. They're going to make all the decisions. We're going to have one review board, and we're going to have one set of tools and you've got consistency, that's great, but you've got one centralized DevOps team, and then everyone else has got to somehow ask them for permission to introduce stuff. Every time you want to release something or change something or automate something, you've got to go to that one team. They immediately become a bottleneck, which is a massive issue. And then all that happens is you just get other teams just building their own stuff anyway, because they don't want to wait, or they don't necessarily agree with the tool choice. The other option is that you say, OK, DevOps is something that everyone can do. We're going to just provide learning. So you kind of get like distributed DevOps, which is a lot quicker. People can build what they want, use what they want. Um, but we ended up with tons of duplication. Um, we, had a, we have our own private cloud and public cloud offering, which has its own API. Um, we were building some integrations with SaltStack a few months ago. Um, and I reached out on our internal system and said, uh, it's like an internal social media tool and said, oh, we're building this. Two other engineers came forward and said they'd already written the same thing. Um, so when it comes around to distributed DevOps, what we found is that there's tons of duplication, um, which in the long run doesn't really help anyone. So the approach that I favor is um, the idea of trying to create more collaboration spaces. So open source, or what's now becoming called intersourcing, which is like you don't want to go the whole hog with open source. You just want to keep it internal, but you apply some of the same kind of ideas and tools. Um, this is actually a really good way of getting teams to collaborate. So uh, I had an engineer from um, Facebook talking about this. He said that um, one of the things they noticed with Facebook is that if a piece of IP in Facebook was open sourced, it's actually more likely to be leveraged within the company. So if it's just on some internal wiki somewhere, and there's like a half a document written about how to use it. And then another team is probably going to build the same thing at some point in time. If they actually open source it, you've actually got to think about how you document it, how you describe what it, do, what it does, 
how are you going to test it? So those kind of things really help to get actually people collaborating and working with the tools. All right, so we're going to go a bit deeper into the tech. Um, so this is something calling integration spaghetti. Um, does everyone recognize at least some of the vendors on the map, more or less? OK, so this is a, this is a diagram from about a week and a half ago. And it was by the, um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, who are working on all the shiny new tools um, in the container space in particular, but also in the data space and analytics space and monitoring. So one of the things we've, we've been working on um, is integration to get these tools to talk to each other. So we started off, um, we were using, uh, so we never really invested in Puppet. We, we started off with SaltStack and also some share. Um, what we then did is we would deploy and configure our database servers using um, one of these configuration management tools. So that was kind of the first integration we did. Then we've got um, Ansible runbooks um, for our public cloud. Uh, and again, with SaltStack has a thing called Salt Cloud. You can provision cloud infrastructure using SaltStack. Terraform um, is, a, is a pretty new tool as well. You can provision different cloud options with Terraform. Um, then when it comes around to Docker, configuring Docker, setting up images and things like that can be done very easily using Chef and Ansible um, and SaltStack. Kubernetes came along, um, which provisions things like service discovery, configures that. It also sets up Docker. And also, the, um, the cube control clustering tool can provision AWS instances for you. We then look at source control, which obviously kicks off into CI, CD, um, our Azure integration, um, and actually the same on AWS, um, is kicking into our alerting um, using things like Twilio and Auth0 for the authentication. Um, and then we kind of kept going and going and going <laughs> and going. And, and then at some point, I think I stopped working on this slide because I got so depressed. And then I looked at our, our, um, one of our Git organi GitHub organizations, and there were 25 projects. These were just ones that we created internally, getting these tools to integrate with each other. And now when we like look at a new inf piece of infrastructure or a new application that we want to get out, actually the end-to-end -end process is, is like, where do you even start? Like, is the preference to start in design it in Kubernetes? But then, what if you're using if you're using only AWS EC2 instances? That's fine. But like, what about all the other AWS stuff you might want to provision? So you can't just use Kubernetes as the kind of starting point. You have to reach out into other tools. Chef, SaltStack has an integration into Kubernetes. Do you start there? Like, what, where does this go? And also, maintaining all of these different integrations has become a massive headache for us. Um, like I said, we have our own cloud, so we provide integrations for our API for um, Terraform, for Ansible, for Docker Machine, um, SaltStack, and yeah, we have to add a new one. It's pretty much every month at the moment, um, but each one is changing continually. So this kind of spaghetti mess is getting really difficult. And then if you in introduce an app which isn't on this chart, um, again, that becomes a massive headache. So one of the things we've used Stackstorm for um, is event-driven DevOps. And it's quite a hard thing to explain to people. When you say, if this, then that, that website where you can kind of configure these drag and clip, uh, when this thing happens, then go and call this API, it does make a bit of sense. Stackstorm goes a lot further. But really, it's kind of trying to avoid these spaghetti integrations between all these different tools. So um, one example we had was our security team uh, used a tool called Qualys. Uh, they're based down the road. It's a scanning tool. Um, <coughs> what Qualys can do is you can put these appliances in your network, and you can give them like a, an IP address space, and it will scan all the IPs and look for vulnerabilities. It's very similar to Nessus, if you've ever used Nessus. It'll go in like ping ports and see what software's running or might have holes. So the security team would go and run these scans on our address list, um, I think it was once a week initially. Um, and they came back to us and said, oh, we want to in, in, improve that to once a day. But we came back and had a whole bunch of examples where a developer or 
um, someone in engineering creating staging environments had provisioned a new instance in EC2 um, or they changed some of the security group settings and they'd done it badly. Like they just said, right, SSH, I don't know what my IP is, I'll just make it open to the internet. Um, and they just like turned off public key and they turned on some dodgy password or something. The machine gets owned. And our experience was that actually takes about an hour, uh, especially on the public cloud. If you have a publicly facing server and it's got SSH open, remote desktop open um, with some sort of terrible password, within about an hour that machine's been hacked. So really actually working with the, the, the security team on Qualys, we're like, well, do we scan our entire IP subnet every hour? Because that's going to be horrible. Do we just lock down EC2 so that no one can provision anything unless they go to the security team? Like, how do we solve the problem? One of the ideas we came up with um, was kind of friendly to both teams, where we have an event um, which gets detected in Stackstorm which picks up whenever anyone deploys a new instance in EC2 or when, everyone, when anyone changes a security group um, in AWS. So it'll kick off a new event, um, and then we've set it up with a rule to say, run this workflow. And it's one that we've designed that, first of all, it talks to the Qualys APIs, and it kicks off a new scan of that subnet. It has a look to see if there are any new vulnerabilities in that group. Um, if there are, it'll go and raise a ticket, it, which in this case, uh, the security team, the uh, SOC, use ServiceNow. So we've already got ServiceNow integration from Stackstorm, Qualys, um, and then also we ping them on instant message via Cisco Spark. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cisco Spark, it's like an enterprise um, version of Slack. You can run it on premise. Uh, another thing we've done is um, we've exposed some of these workflows internally. So we've actually leveraged the API to write our own. UIs, um, which has really let us lock down what the ops team can do. So operations want access to PowerShell, um, for example. Like we have a large exchange environment we run for clients. They say, can you just give us full access to PowerShell? Like, okay, what are you wanting to do? Like which levels of engineers? Um, we then went down the path of actually thinking about um, role-based access control, but in in Windows land, what you actually have to do is you have to specify for each command that who, can't, who can and who can't do which things. Really, the best approach um, that we came up with was designing runbooks um, using a tool called System Center Orchestrator, or Scorch. It's a Microsoft product. Um, also, we can use Azure Automation, which is a newer product that Microsoft are pushing out. Um, but we don't have any way of integrating into those tools. So we have another integration which hooks into those APIs um, and really kind of controls what ops can and can't do. And it's all within the same space. Another example we used um, with Stackstorm, this is the old UI. This is the old screenshot. Um, like I said, we have our own cloud. Um, clients were kind of asking us around how they can provision the dual cloud environments and how they can have parts of their application leveraging one cloud and parts leveraging another. So what we did is we built um, some workflows in the um, Stackstorm sort of workflow designer to bring together the Azure integration and our own pack, which we developed for Dimension Data's cloud, um, and then hook into Chef at the same time. So this is kind of like how you can bring in multi-cloud. But when I look at other multi-cloud products out there, they just focus on provisioning infrastructure. And then you've actually still got to think about how you configure that infrastructure. Um, Pretty much all of the multi-cloud tools out there only do VMs as well. So you've, all you can do is you can provision some VMs, and then you've still got to go into the AWS console or the APIs and provision all the security groups and the ELB instances and the S3 buckets. So it doesn't really save you that much time. So what we've managed to do with this is create a set of workflows which can provision a, a running application across multiple clouds and actually leverage all the PaaS components, not just the uh, simple IO stuff. So um, coming back to my original point about collaboration, um, these workflows that I was talking about <coughs> and these integrations, um, with Stackstorm, they're contained by packs. Like the pack is something that you can create, you can name, you can version. It's all stored in Git. So there's not like a proprietary workflow format. The workflow engine is written um, using OpenStack Mistral 
The workflows themselves are all YAML, so all the developers can read them. It's easy to understand. But what it actually allows us to do is leverage the broader community. So there's about 100 and something integrations now, um, which are existing into a lot of the apps you saw on the slide with Spaghetti, um, as well as some of the ones we use in the big enterprise client. So uh, we have Slack integration, Cisco Spark integration, um, Yammer, ServiceNow, um, Qualys, like I said, but a lot of the other security products we work with as well. So we kind of leverage the broader community of existing integrations, but then we have all of our own. And what we do with those is we house them all in our own internal Git servers, um, so the teams can actually see all the packs, all the integrations, all the existing workflows. It's kind of like a hub of all those solved problems that we've already gone through. And that's all, it, I'd like it to be open source, but we're not quite there yet. Um, it's basically like a shared source repository within the company. So we can all keep specific point integrations or specific tools that we'd like to use for different things, but at least we have like a central repository where we can actually think about the workflows which span across them. Um, and when we talk about DevOps, it's the, where the event-driven automation comes in is you've got CI, CD problems, which a lot of DevOps tools try and solve. But when actually when you get into production, it's like, okay, the monitoring system says that there's been an issue. So what, like you send it to an engineer, it goes in the queue, they go and do some diagnostics, and then maybe they fix it. So the automation way of doing that would be to write a custom script which would run on a cron task or something to go and check for, is this service running? No, check this thing, and then maybe run this command. And then you'd either end up with all these different cron tasks running on different machines, and which again becomes a bit of a mess. So what we can do with Stackstorm is we can build those um, as existing rules, and we can put the rules and the workflows into the pack. We can give the pack a name and say, this is like an operations pack for this application we've built, um, and all the teams around the company can leverage it. So my kind of three, three points of advice is when you're looking at DevOps in an organization, when you're talking to your teams about DevOps, when you're talking to your colleagues about DevOps, um, if they ever start talking about centralizing DevOps or creating a central DevOps team, please, please, please push them away from that. It is a dead end, I can assure you. Um, yeah, we've operated, we operate with a number of very large clients, um, all of which have kind of gone down that path, um, and it hasn't ended well. It's just become a bottleneck, and all that ends up happening is different teams will actually go and provision their own tools anyway, because they get so sick of waiting. Um, like I said, open source is really critical, especially when you look at workflow automation. Um, we'd worked with some tools in the past um, which had sort of proprietary workflow formats, and they'd either get stored in like a SQL database or it would be in some custom file system or something. And actually getting the workflows out of those tools was a real, real pain. All we could do was create a backup. Um, and if another team, one of them, um, yeah, was stored in a SQL database, and we had all this knowledge in there about how to automate a lot of our Windows environments. Um, another team was using the same product, but all we had to do was basically like export it into some crazy XML format and then like email it to them, and then they, they could hopefully import it if they had the same version. Um, and just getting the two teams to work together about problems they'd solve was like close to impossible. So I say open source is key, but it's more about like, okay, not just about the source code, it's about all the other you know, artifacts from the problems. So when you look at DevOps, when you look at automation problems, what are the actual artifacts that your teams are creating? And can they see them, can they share them, and can they collaborate? Because if you don't get that bit right, then what you'll get is either trying to force down the centralization path, or you'll just get different teams using different tools, and you'll just get loads of duplication all over the place. Um, and my other point um, is around continuous learning, which is very relevant for us and for a lot of our clients. They focus on um, accreditation. So when was your last CCIE or your RHCA or whatever accreditation it is? These things are becoming a lot re less relevant. So if you do work in, if you're wanting to get into the DevOps space, um, it's not about your boss sending you on like a course and you go on a three-day course and you're done. This stuff changes like every week, every month. Um, so I'd recommend investing in a continuous learning provider. Um, there are some really good online ones. Um, we've just 
recently got a, an agreement with Pluralsight, which is great. Um, but we're trying to get our engineers to think about dedicating an hour or two a week to updating all their skills. Like it's not about, like I said, going on a course for three days a year or even once a quarter. It's about actually trying to dedicate time in your week, every single week, to try and update your skills because this stuff is moving so fast. Not just the continuous learning, but I'd also recommend just keeping on top of blogs um, and podcasts as well. There's some really great DevOps podcasts out there. Um, but if you haven't tried out Stackstorm yet, then I'd recommend kind of installing it and having a play around. But not just trying to think about, OK, how can I use this to do another CI CD workflow? Because that's a solved problem. There are a lot of other hairier issues in the organization, in your operations team, maybe even in your development teams that you can try and solve. So <coughs> once you've installed it, once you've set it up, just go and ask them. You know, in what kind of issues do you have to do day to day? What things do you have to do manually day to day? And just see if you can figure out how you might automate those. If you can, then come back and share it on the community. And then hopefully you've made someone else's lives a bit easier as well. So yeah, if you want to keep in touch, um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, also very active on GitHub. My GitHub handle is Tony Baloney. Um, Baloney, yeah, I love the sausage. Um, and that's my email address if you need to get in contact with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Yes. All oh, right, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, and then in the new release, which came out yesterday, did I mention? Monday. Monday. <laughs> um, there is the, the packs that I talked about. So there's a new website called exchange.stackstorm.com, which is called the Stackstorm Exchange. That's like, sorry? That's org. Org. <laughs> um, That's where all the integrations are. So if you wanted to integrate into um, AWS, for example, then there's already a pack that contains the sensors, so the things that detect the events, and the actions. So that's like an individual task that you might do, like create an S3 bucket or deploy an RDS instance. Um, and also it would contain things like aliases, which is the chat ops integration, which is another feature. There's a lot to go into in terms of integrations, but it'll contain um, sensors, uh, the actions, the aliases, which are like chat ops, so you can call each action via a tool. And you can also include all the workflows as well. So there's two formats. There's the OpenStack Mistral workflow format, um, or there's another format, which is like a simple like list of um, commands that you can run. So you put those in the packs. Um, it's all synced via Git. And then you can have a, there's basically a Git repository per pack. Um, Stackstorm have like an organization with all the, all the public packs. If you have a new one that you want to contribute, um, you can basically push that into their organization, um, and then it's open source for everyone. Anyone who's running Stackstorm can then say install pack, pack name, and it will, it will go and pull it from GitHub. Um, if there's any updates to the pack, whether they're just pushed, pushed to the master branch, um, then you can just update those, again, using the same tool. Um, the Stackstorm Exchange, the, the web app, um, and also the Git model and all the CI tools and stuff are also available um, if you want to go and pull those and run, run them yourself. So you can actually run your own internal exchange, um, which is only, I mean, it's only come out on Monday. Um, but I think this is going to be a really good model where your organization might not be ready to put every piece of IP on GitHub yet. Um, but at least you can kind of have an internal exchange about this is how we integrate this you know, app that we made ourselves and hasn't been touched for ages. Um, we've done some pretty, some pretty horrendous ones as well. It doesn't have to have like a really nice REST API. The pack actions themselves are basically um, Python, Python scripts. Um, so for newer stuff, it's easy because you can just install the Python module. Hopefully there is one, and just call the API. So it's like a, it's a tiny wrapper. Um, but for the more complex stuff, like we've had to integrate into a lot of stuff that only has a command line option. Um, so you can actually wrap around command line tools as well. Um, and some other ones we've had, which, which only are available in PowerShell. 
So we've got like PowerShell wrappers as well. Yeah, and also, sorry, that's one other thing you can add in the pack is a, is a test suite. Um, so the public packs, uh, you'll, there's like a tick next to the ones that include test suites, um, but you can include those as well. And that, that goes into the same CI, CD um, workflow. So if you've got a pack, it can include the actions, the workflows, um, and also the tests. So if anyone else in the company wants to make additions or alterations to the pack, then it would go through all the test suite first. 